Well, may I express my thanks to both speakers for their presentations, which I think have given us a great deal to think about. If I can suggest that there are two themes, uh, one, and really it's an interrelated theme and problem, it is the relationship between continuity in terms of what navies do and what navies need to do, and complexity in relation to the emerging problems, the changing world, and indeed the changing challenges. And I think it was Admiral Haney's point that, taken from the Secretary, that one always must adjust one's resources to match one's priorities. And I think the problem, and it isn't simply one of money, as the Admiral suggested, it is an intellectual problem, it is a problem of thought and a problem of fact, is deciding exactly where we need to move in adjusting our individual priorities. I now throw the floor open to questions. Could I remind uh, the audience that we are seeking questions? I'd ask you to make them short. I prefer if you, in fact, directed them to either one or both speakers. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I welcome questions. Okay, we'll go back left and then middle. Hey, good morning, sirs. Uh, Lieutenant Commander Trevor Gibson, I'm an Operational Test Director with the RN's Test Evaluation and Acceptance Authority. My question is uh, directed to both members, and it's to do with the ability of the USN to conduct power projection through their strategy of forward deployment. This allows them to influence, to provide presence, and also to undertake deterrence. My question relates to two recent events in the US, namely uh, sequestration, uh, in some cases called castration, um, and also the recent government shutdown. Does this influence the ability of the USN to provide power projection? Uh, and if it does, sh through their rebalance program, do you have the ability to measure how much it has been reduced? Uh, good question. I thank you for it. There's no doubt that we're uh, working uh, politically, uh, sequestration and uh, this government shutdown. Uh, those of you paying attention uh, to the news uh, can see that we're getting through this. You know, uh, although we're shut down, I'm here. Uh, and you can also read that uh, our DOD and our governmental folks are in fact coming back to work. Uh, like everything, it's a journey. But I can assure you during this journey, we've maintained our credible capability of the United States Navy forward, not just in the Indo-Asia Pacific region, uh, but in other parts of the world. So we didn't stop the screws turning and the radar spinning for those radars that do spin today, most of which don't. But we're out and about, just as we have been, quite frankly, as a naval force. So uh, I thank you for that question, but uh, we continue to move about militarily. Thank you. Uh, yeah, um, I just, to add to what Admiral Haney said, and I think this is, this is true of current political developments. It's, it's also true of, of policy statements like, um, like, the, like, like the rebalance. The truth is the United States has a long-term involvement in and a long-term interest in and, and deep uh, engagement with the Asia-Pacific region. And you know, our, our shift in focus and shift in emphasis uh, to the region predated you know, the, 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 the current administration's emphasis on the rebalance, which I actually think is a good thing. Uh, we, you know, we began, it's really been going on, um, although in, in low profile for probably about a dozen, a dozen years or so. And so similarly, I think it would be, it's very easy to, to get wrapped up in the, in the current headlines and lose uh, sight of the fact that really it, it has been a, uh, a long-term policy of the United States across administrations to place greater emphasis on, on the region. So whatever happens in the very short term, I, I think we're, we're seeing the playing out of a, of a longer term uh, increase in focus and, and emphasis on, on, on the region. Okay. 
Okay, in the middle. Uh, Lieutenant Commander Josh Wilson, I'm with the uh, DDG Capability Implementation Team. Uh, I'd like to direct my question to uh, Professor Mankin there. Uh, your points this morning on, on the, uh, the, the role of persistence and the, uh, the idea of deterrence and the, the way we need to move ahead, I thank you very much for those, but I would ask the question, are, are we looking at a very traditional role in the state on state actor uh, as, a, as a traditional role for persistence and deterrence? And I'd be curious on your thoughts on how you see those roles developing in the future as we see the rise of the non-state actor uh, and, how we, and, and the, the difficulties in identifying them to actually apply that deterrence and persistence role. Yeah, no, that's a wonderful, it's a wonderful question and I, I wish I could give you a, a very neat definitive answer, but I can't. Um, and, but, but what I can say is that, look, deterrence is, is situational and it's, it's targeted. I mean, you, you, you seek to deter uh, a particular actor, whether it's a state or a non-state state actor, and your ability to deter that state or non-state actor depends very much up upon, the, upon the situation. Um, and I just think it's a, it's a topic that hasn't uh, gotten the, you know, the amount of attention that it probably deserves. We assume a lot about the ability of, of just say, naval forces to deter. Um, and you know, my, my plea is for a little bit more study um, so that we can figure out really what does deter particular actors in particular situations and also what, what, what doesn't. So I w yeah, I certainly wouldn't limit um, my comments to, uh, to states. Um, I would say deterring, deterring states can be difficult enough uh, and, and non-state actors can be even, even more difficult. One other uh, more, uh, if I can put a practical application to this, something that we navies do do together and that is we're working hard at uh, understanding the maritime domain and how to look at it, how to fuse together the information. You know, I look at, for example, Singapore and their, um, their fusion center uh, approach, uh, for example, and there are other approaches depending on what part of the globe uh, we look at. But the more and more we delve into that piece uh, with that goal of holistically trying to neck down on the inability to prevent non-state actors from being able to use the sea commons uh, as a means of transport and mischief uh, is a collective goal I think everybody in the room would raise their hand on. And it's how do we get there, how do we make that uh, aware that that's not the uh, option of ease uh, has been something we've been working on and, and must continue to do. And in some cases I think it has been serving as a deterrent in other cases, we got to continue to step up the game. Um. Uh, good morning. Uh, Lee Corden, University of Adelaide. Um, my question's addressed to both Professor Mencken and to Admiral Haney. Um, we'll, we'll all recall, I'm sure, that uh, Clausewitz and Corbett both wrote about the importance of understanding the nature of a conflict, and in contemporary risk management terms, um, that could be translated to understanding the risk context. So in this changing environment that you've both spoken about, I wonder how you see the risks and opportunities emerging, particularly in the area uh, that one of the questioners has already raised of the um, relationship between many players who are, are not only navies in this business of managing maritime security and dealing with maritime security risks and opportunities. Thank you. Um, Lee, it's an excellent, uh, um, it's an excellent question. Uh, I think the, um, you know, maritime security offers a, a great, a great opportunity, uh, a great opportunity for, for cooperation. Um, but as you, as you note, you know, understanding the nature of the war or the nature of the problem, uh, if you will, is, uh, can, can, be a big, can be a big challenge. And I think when we, um, when we, do, when we do so, um, we have to differentiate between a number of, of different types of actors. So uh, even within, say, non-state actors, 
um, I would differentiate between, say, those with political motivations, meaning whether you want to call them that, well, in, insurgents, guerrillas, terrorists, those who fundamentally are, are seeking to use the commons uh, to, uh, to political, to political uh, effect, and, say, pirates who are economically motivated. Those are two very different sets of actors. So sort of the, the logic of strategy, I think, clearly applies to political actors. Um, the, the kind of the logic of, of benefit and, and uh, risk, I think, applies more clearly to, to pirates. Most, most pirates don't have a political agenda. Uh, their, their agenda is profit. And if you can drive up the, the risk you know, sufficiently to them, well, they'll go seek uh, money other ways, legal or, or illegal. Uh, but a political actor that's seeking, you know, a political objective uh, in in competition with yours, there's a different there's a different sort of calculus there. So I, I you know, I would very much uh, echo uh, Clausewitz and that you know the, the the Supreme Act is to understand the nature of the war you're fighting, neither mistaking it for something something that it isn't or trying to turn it into something that it's alien to its nature. Uh, I think oftentimes, you know, just parsing out who we're talking about, the, the nature of those actors, what their motivations are, uh, and what they seek, and then how we can affect them, that's, that uh, takes us a long way to developing a strategy to deal with them. I, I would agree wholeheartedly, and, and I would say, uh, uh, although this is a maritime conference, uh, as we look at getting the non-state actors and, and applying that, risk and opportunities as you described. The real key is re removing seams and gaps from the maritime domain to the other domains by which these actors reside. We have to understand, frame the problem, uh, and get at it in a holistic uh, framework and not just in segregated constructs, if you will. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Emma Miller from Chilean Navy. To Professor Mencken, I want to ask, uh, do you think is, if, is there any constraint for the small navies as mine to apply the same attributes you mentioned for the big navies? Mm. Um, that's, that's an excellent question. I think, um, I think one trade-off that, that all nations, all navies face is the trade-off between providing sovereign capability and working as part of a greater coalition or, or alliance. Um, and you know, sovereign capability tends to drive you, uh, any navy, small or large, to try to do everything. Uh, whereas burden sharing, working across uh, alliances and coalitions allows you um, some more flexible choices. And so I think, you know, one, uh, one, of, the, one of the decisions, and I'll say that, face, uh, that all navies face, um, perhaps it's more acute for, for small navies, but I think all navies face is what, you know, what capabilities can they rely upon others to provide or f rely upon other, uh, other uh, armed forces or institutions to provide, and what do they absolutely need to keep uh, for themselves? So I think, I think actually the, the choices are, are, are universal. I think the, the challenge that small navies face is just, you know, fewer, fewer resources in the basket and so the choices are maybe sharper, but I think everybody, everybody faces those choices. Uh, good morning. Uh, Captain Tony Aldred, uh, Director of Current Operations, Headquarters, Joint Operations Command. Uh, my question is to Admiral Haney, but I'd, I'd invite comments from you too soon. Uh, uh, given uh, India is a, a non-aligned country, but it's strategically positioned in regards to global maritime security, in um, both the Indian Ocean and the Malacca Strait contexts. Uh, how do you see the US relationship with India developing 
in the near to uh, medium term. Uh, who will lead, given the juncture between PACOM and CENTCOM uh, across the continent of India? And what role do you think Australia should play in further developing those relationships, uh, given that we are already involved in IONS and other similar fora? Good question. Uh, clearly, uh, you know, from the United States of America, but more appropriately in my role from the United States Navy, uh, we continue to work uh, with uh, the Indian Navy. Uh, I think, quite frankly, a fairly decent uh, relationship uh, as we work our Malabar exercise series, various port visits and what have you. I had the unique uh, pleasure of traveling to India uh, near the beginning of this year. And uh, it was great to finally get there uh, and talk to the leadership there. As with any country, uh, every country has its values and, and its sovereignty as we've described here. And uh, just as the United States of America, and it's very important that we work to understand each other and, and work where there are common interests that we continue to work that area uh, with due diligence. And I think that's important. Uh, when you, you uh, ask the question in Australia's role, uh, when I look at uh, this Indo-Asia Pacific region, uh, I look at it as not something that I do alone when it comes to naval business. It's one that I clearly count on uh, the work of other nations. Uh, the business, as I travel about, one of my questions is how uh, do other nations other Navy leaders uh, and their governments look at the world through their lens, not through my lens, so I can understand it better. That's why this intellectual rebalance to me is so darn important uh, that we do that, and we do that with a patient uh, approach uh, to clearly work to understand the values of each country, because each country has its own uniqueness uh, and interests and vital interests associated with solution solving. So uh, when you say who will lead, uh, right now I know whose uh, area of operation and responsibility that is, my boss at Pacific Command, Admiral Sam Locklear. And I won't speculate uh, in terms of a future associated with some of the articles you may have been reading, uh, et cetera. That's where we are today. And uh, uh, more to follow perhaps in the future. But uh, as we look at how uh, the U.S. has split up the world in terms of geographical combatant commands. Uh, we don't work in isolation. Quite frankly, if there's anything that I've seen during my tenure as a naval officer, as a joint officer, is just how we have worked hard and do due diligence every day to reduce those seams so we aren't working in isolation. Thank you for your question. And I would, I would uh, agree with, uh, with what Admiral Haney has said. Uh, you know, look, the, the Indian Navy is a, is a highly, highly capable Navy, and, and India is, uh, you know, is, is, a great, is a great power. Um, I think one of the good things about, uh, about being a Navy and maritime relations is sometimes it, it, it is easier to cooperate um, in, the, in the maritime realm than you know, than in than in other spheres, and I think certainly my you know, with my limited experience between uh, uh, U.S. Uh, Indian cooperation in the in the naval realm, I think that's 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 very very much uh, the case. I think um, as to the the scope and pace of that cooperation, that's really you know that's really driven driven by governments, and governments respond to their electorates and and all sorts of all sorts of things. Uh, I do think that you know over the long term. If you think about coincidence of, of interests, and you also think about shared uh, shared values, I think there's a lot there's a lot that India and the United States have have in common. And so, um, quite apart from any particular sort of timetable, uh, I think I'm very very bullish on on uh, Indo-American relations. I think Australia has a, a very important role to play, and it's already I think is playing that role, uh, just given Australia's geography and ge Australia's a constellation of, of relationships. Australia is positioned, it's part of the Commonwealth. Uh, I think it's, it, it can play a very important role. Um, and finally, I, I can't, I can't hesit hesitate, because uh, Admiral Haney raised the, uh, 
the, 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 uh, the, the, pr the point of the, the unified command plan and the way that our, our uh, geographic commands are set up. Uh, as, a, as a veteran of a number of those, uh, of those go-arounds, there's, there's, no <laughs> there's no perfect way to do it. There's just various, various shades of compromise. There's, you redraw the lines or take lines away. There's no, there's no perfect solution. Um, so we should never, I, I should, we should never uh, fool ourselves that there is a, a, an optimal out there. Uh, given the nature of that question and the presence of uh, an Indian Navy representative, I was wondering if Admiral Chopra would care to comment. Would you, be, would you care to comment on the question yourself, sir? Please, sir. Well, thank you for your comments in the first place about the Indian Navy and its uh, role over here. I think I would tend to agree with uh, both the speakers that the relationships of India and its Navy with the Indo-Pacific is only increasing and uh, that it is possibly uh, stronger on the maritime to maritime front and we'll take it from there. Uh, that's about what I could say now. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any more? Yep, Linda, the microphone's on its way. Good morning, Linda Jacobson from the Lowy Institute for International Policy. Um, I'd like to address my question um, mainly, I would say, to Admiral Haney. Um, have you been involved with the recent s uh, search and rescue exercises with the Chinese PLA Navy? Um, and looking forward um, and thinking of RIMPAC next year, um, how do you see cooperation between the U.S. and China in the maritime sphere? Thank you. Well, Linda, thank you for that question. It's uh, very interesting that uh, here at the International Fleet Review, uh, the PLAN ship Chengdao uh, also participated. Uh, that ship and two other ships that were with it very recently visited uh, Hawaii. I was there. Uh, Actually, I was there on the pier when they uh, came in to greet them. We truly value our opportunities to do mill to mill with them. And in fact, at the conclusion of that port visit, uh, we did conduct a uh, bilateral uh, search and rescue exercise uh, with uh, those ships. And uh, to me, uh, coming on the hills of numerous uh, exchanges in, in terms of uh, strategic talks between uh, my leadership, Chinese leadership, including president to president. Uh, I followed, uh, I was on the heels of Chairman Dempsey's visit to China, where I went to China, visited uh, both uh, Beijing and then the South Sea Fleet headquarters. Uh, able to see Chief of Navy uh, Admiral Wu and was really happy to see him follow up that uh, visit with a visit to the United States where he went through San Diego, one of our major uh, Pacific Fleet uh, hubs. And also uh, he went to the DC with the CNO and, and continued in with that exchange on the East Coast. Uh, quite frankly, uh, it is so important in my opinion that navies work together and that uh, as we have uh, in some cases differences that we work on those areas that we do commonly uh, need to value and work uh, as, as a team. So clearly our Navy to Navy, military to military uh, uh, work uh, to, and relationships has a long ways to go just getting started because there was a gap in terms of what we were doing. So when uh, previous Secretary of Defense invited uh, the Chinese Navy to participate in Rim of the Pacific, we went to work. We've participated in one initial planning conference. Uh, it's been talked about and fr frankly, every visit that they've uh, come to the United States or we go over there. Uh, so it's clearly a, a, a high interest. And quite frankly, it's a, RIMPAC is a great forum because it's a multilateral event. 
And there we will do uh, things that all navies value and participate in, mentoring, assistance, uh, search and rescue, as you've mentioned, and some other areas. So uh, I'm quite frankly uh, very excited about this uh, possibility of bringing China to RIMPAC. We had Russia for the first time in RIMPAC last year. And uh, it is an area where, although we have senior leaders uh, of the navies that are participating in the, the work that's done there, it to me is the interaction of the sailors that also is a key contributor to, uh, to our future. And just watching that magic rim pack after rim pack uh, quite frankly, and even when I was in China, we had the uh, cruiser Shiloh that was part of that ship's visit. Uh, seeing our sailors interact with Chinese uh, Navy sailors uh, was also uh, a good thing to have. What we don't want is to go through long periods where we're not talking to uh, a, a group there because we're all on the maritime commons together. So we have to be able to communicate with each other so that there aren't any miscalculations based on miscommunication. So this whole business of port visits, high-level visits, and of course, uh, Rim of the Pacific. Uh, my only regret in Rim of the Pacific is I won't be commanding the Pacific Fleet when that comes around. But very excited about the participation, not just of China, but of all the nations that come. Thank you. David. Uh, David Letts, um, Centre for Military and Security Law, Australian National University. Um, question for both speakers. The uh, intellectual rebalance that uh, Admiral Haney was talking about, uh, do you see as part of that scope for a realignment of America's position um, in relation to the Law of the Sea Convention and some final progress going to happen in that area, perhaps? Sure, I'll, I'll start off on that. Look, I, I think... Um, I would start with the U.S. Constitution, which gives the Senate the power to ratify treaties. Uh, and it is a fact that multiple administrations uh, since the, uh, you know, the uh, Law of the Sea Treaty was, was concluded have sought ratification. Um, but up until now, the Senate, with uh, different political parties in, in majority over time, uh, they've failed to secure the number of votes to, to ratify the, the treaty. That having been said, the United States acts in accordance with the, the Law of the Sea Treaty and has done so for years and years. Um, other countries have ratified the treaty and, and haven't acted in accordance with the treaty. Um, so w look, what, what you have is, is uh, what, what would, you know, from, as an observer, what would really need to happen uh, for the, the treaty to be ratified, it would be for a president to expend I think, significant political capital to try to, to, try to, to, try to do that. Um, but as I say, uh, even though it's unratified, if you look at the U.S. behavior, the U.S. behaves routinely and has for, for years and for decades at this point um, in accordance with the law of the sea treaty. So That was so astutely answered that I don't think I need <laughs> to say any more. Thank you. Next. Uh, Admiral Sir, uh, Professor Mark, and my name is Mitchum, sorry, Mitchum Nam Ewan, Australian Defence Force Academy. I'd like to build on the last two questions for, uh, from Linda and, and for, uh, David Letts with regards to also the cooperation and um, in a domestic sense. Now, the crisis group suggested that perhaps uh, a lot of tensions and, and miscalculations is not necessarily between navies and mill-mill relations, and that a lot of domestic actors and domestic law enforcement agencies are inciting tensions, and that's where the miscalculations can occur. Can you provide your comments on the need to, to uh, break through that in terms of cooperating also with domestic uh, law enforcement agencies to ensure that miscalculations do not occur? All right, I'll uh, start on this one, um, if I've got your question right. Uh, this gets into, for me, uh, why it's so important that is uh, a military, you can't be disconnected from your governmental organizations either, and you have to work to minimize those seams. 
There's one thing I would say uh, in particular our counterterrorism uh, efforts have done, uh, in particular since 9-11, has glued together for us in the U.S. Uh, a, 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 a lot of glue between our uh, various organizations uh, in the government. And that piece has been important, and that's why when I talk rebalance, I always talk about a whole of government approach, uh, not just the Navy, not just the military, but that whole of government, very important uh, in terms of, of, of that business. And as you astutely, I think, tried to pull out here or did, and, and that is when you look at mo military law enforcement ag agencies and what they do, uh, in the region here, very important that we understand uh, their uh, their rules of the road, you know, who they're working for, et cetera, and make sure as we find uh, maritime solutions to the problem that, that we look at it holistically and not just looking at it uh, uh, as an approach in, in one area. And I would also uh, say that it's not just maritime law enforcement agencies, it's, it's the business of uh, being able to look at all domains, whether that's space, cyber, et cetera, uh, in terms of uh, activities. And then where do we as navies, uh, where is our most effective role in, in participating to work to deter, assure, et cetera? And I think cer certainly, certainly agree with Admiral Haney and you know, from a U.S. perspective, I think, you know, one of the very powerful uh, levers that, that we have that's, I think, oftentimes underappreciated is the U.S. Coast Guard. Uh, both, you know, the, the Coast Guard uh, itself and its, its maritime law enforcement role, but also the Coast Guard attaches that serve in, in embassies across, across the world, including in, in Asia. I think, in, in my, you know, in my experience, those, uh, those Coast Guard officers have, have played a very important role uh, in speaking directly to to other maritime safety and maritime law enforcement uh, uh, organizations uh, across the region, and I think they, they really do play a, an important role. Yeah, it is interesting. I, I do have a, a Coast Guard officer that's uh, on my staff that allows us to facilitate even better communications and that to share. Okay, before we go to the bright, I'm going to in fact take uh, a Twitter question from Alistair Cooper, which is. Tom, as you can see, to expand on future flexibility of navies and precision strike in the context mm -hmm. of developments in cyber and unmanned vehicles. I think um, unmanned, unmanned systems, uh, really with unmanned aerial vehicles kind of leading the way, do, do offer um, some substantial opportunities to maintain and increase the flexibility of, of, of navies. Um, particularly application of UAVs for maritime domain awareness. Uh, I think, and this actually uh, ties back to the, to the previous question, I, I think you know, a, a key element of uh, disputed actions in, in Asian waters has to do with just, just ground truth. Who did what, what happened? Uh, and so I think uh, the ability of manned platforms, but, but particularly unmanned platforms to, to cover broad uh, ocean areas do broad ocean area uh, surveillance um, is offers an opportunity to to really multiply um, the ability of naval forces to to project presence and uh, and and to deter and to reassure. So I think that's actually uh, I think that's actually a, um, an important one. I think unmanned undersea vehicles. Um, Similarly, although I just, uh, you know, I think that the nature of the domain, the nature of the technology is not as mature uh, there and uh, less accessible. Well, I agree uh, uh, clearly with Professor Mankin. Uh, this whole business of unmanned gives us persistence in a different way. Uh, and then uh, using it to uh, improve our intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance capability, important. Uh, and obviously, uh, we are in the United States use it to, to integrate with our other ISR kind of capabilities, give us a broader picture. Uh, I think the question also dealt with uh, strike uh, in, in that business of uh, 
UAVs and being able to use them for precision strike and what have you. And I think the history book has already been written uh, in terms of that uh, as I consider that part of the package of precision strike kinds of capability. Thank you. Um, James Dedarian from the Center for National Security Studies, uh, University of Sydney. Um, Tip O'Neill, the congressman, said that uh, all politics is local. We're getting a lesson in that right now um, in the United States in um, what's going on in our U.S. Congress. And um, I'm just curious how much the Asian pivot and um, even the operational uh, capability of the U.S. Navy is being affected by uh, a shutdown, a federal shutdown, um, and how that might play out in the future. Um, if a very small minority in the United States Congress can effectively um, affect not only, you know, economics of military preparedness, but also the doctrine in the sense that there is a new isolationism in amongst a, a minority, a very vocal and very effective minority. How do you see that down the line um, influencing U.S. strategy in the Pacific? And I understand as a military flag officer a reluctance to get into politics, but your boss, Secretary of Defense Hagel, has been very vocal about this. So I'm just curious as to how it might in the future um, cause a realignment or a reassessment of capacity and ambitions in the Pacific? Well, I think my boss answered that question recently here when asked, and he, when he asked, uh, was it affecting our operations, he said no, and, and very pointedly answered that question. So uh, I agree with him. The, uh, but I will say, uh, as a Pacific Fleet Commander, I mean, I have about a third of my fleet out and about doing things today. And in, in not just in this region, as I talked about earlier when I was up there uh, for the presentation and the first question that was asked in the back, uh, we will continue uh, to work the rebalance. I showed a slide up here, and maybe it was missed. It showed the cyclic behavior of our budgetary business because it, you know, it's money that is a major portion of the resources. Time is also a resource, and people, obviously. But that money buys people and talent uh, associate. The, uh, with those peaks and valleys, we haven't left. Even when we were very, very busy in another AOR, we didn't, not only did we not leave, we were on a steady improvement of capability out here. Uh, so uh, my answer remains the same. We are committed to this rebalance uh, and quite frankly, uh, I won't speculate with you uh, over how the Congress of the United States will come out with an answer here between now and X number of days. I will just say historically, we have worked our democracy, and that I'm very proud of, and come up with a solution, and then we moved ahead. So uh, that's the way I see where uh, this rebalance will stay on a course, and uh, the business of democracy We'll continue to churn, and we'll have a solution, and we'll continue to move forward. Thank you. I guess my, my uh, you know, my, my two cents is, look, that I think there is a very broad consensus in Congress in favor of a, of a strong U.S. international role. And I would note that despite the failure of the executive and the legislature to agree on uh, a budget, Congress very early on gave the Secretary of Defense the authority to keep not only the, the, the military uh, on duty, but keep uh, put uh, uh, DOD civilians back to work. And DOD civilians, as, as Admiral Haney said, are, are back to work. So I would say regardless of the domestic politics having to do with uh, spending priorities and the, and, and the size of the budget, I think there is a broad internationalist uh, consensus within Congress. You're right. There, there are... Uh, there are isolationists on the very left wing and the very right wing of the political spectrum, um, as there are, as there is a, a you know a, a body of thought in Australia that sort of aims for sort of armed armed neutrality as opposed to the Australia-U.S. alliance. Um, but I would also say that the last you know the last electoral cycle that uh, the United States went through after the 2008 financial crisis should have been the perfect opportunity for isolationism to arise in the United States. And it didn't. Um, so again, something might change in the future, 
Uh, but you know, it's, I've I've lived long enough to hear you know sort of with every every decade, every generation, concerns about American isolationism. Um, Look, the truth is the United States really wasn't that isolationist in the 1920s or 30s, at least as far as Asia was concerned. Um, again, maybe something will change in the future, but I wouldn't bet on it. Thank you. Good morning. David Palmer, Concerned Civilian. Um, and uh, I'm here to get a better understanding of how we use our navies to keep us secure. But my question based uh, to both the professor and the admiral is, if I'm correct in my readings, Within the next three years, China will put to sea its first carrier. Not long after that, possibly its second. Now this running around and being the bonhomie and all this sort of thing amongst navies is all very well, but it's not totally reassuring to us civilians. Navies are here to protect us and to fight. So my question is, uh, what, why do the Chinese see a necessity for aircraft carriers? What do they intend to do with them? And finally, what impact will this have on strategy? Thank you. Well, one, Mr. Palmer, I thank you for your interest in the maritime domain and uh, your thoughtful question. Um, one piece I do want to say is, uh, as far as I'm concerned, China has already put a carrier to sea. And uh, putting it in a bigger frame, as you look at China's economy, as you look at China's dependency on what we talked about here a bit over just how much trade flows through the maritime domain, uh, I think China is also interested in maritime security and the secure transport of its commodities and goods to and fro. When so much of our trade goes by sea, that's a, a common interest amongst all nations. So as Chinese economy improved, not surprising to me that China would increase their maritime capability across the board. It's not a surprise. Uh, quite frankly, given their interests globally of where all this, the resources and what have you come from today, where they will come from in the future. And that's why I think it's uh, very important that we uh, continue to work on a mill-to-mill, navy-to-navy, uh, uh, navies to navies with China so that we can continue to work uh, uh, to, to uh, make sure we can communicate with each other where it matters in, in that regard. Probably as we look at any country with growing military capability, the real key is how transparent is that, how transparent is not just what they're building and how they use it, but what's their overall intent. And that's the piece that I think time will tell as we go forward. Um, as to you know, as to why China wants wants aircraft carriers, I think I think there's a you know I think there's a mixture of motivations. Um, one of the big ones being status. So that 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 you know one of the one of the major um, coins of the naval realm you know for the for the last uh, number of decades is 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 having an aircraft carrier. Um, and so I think part of, you know, a good part of the Chinese carrier uh, program is, is status. And, is a, and it's certainly the, the Liaoning and the, 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 the carrier program where generally has become an object of a lot of, uh, a lot of national, national pride. Now, it's also, uh, you know, a, a, military, a military unit. And I think for, you know, for military purposes, they're interested in a carrier for regional presence, regional uh, power projection. Um, it's tremendously expensive to, to build aircraft carriers and maintain aircraft carriers and, and to develop the, the skills uh, to, to operate them, including the, the air wing. Um, in terms of the, you know, the capabilities that China's been acquiring, um, I think they're, it's, it's not at the top of, uh, of my list of things that keeps me up at night, um, quite honestly. Um, but yeah, I think it's a mixture of, of prestige, motivation, and, and the, the capabilities that that, uh, that type of a carrier brings to bear. Eric. Thanks. Um, Eric Grove, Liverpool Hope University. Uh, once upon a time, there was another gl great global power called the British Empire, and it did have its forward deployed capital uh, ship assets, actually. Mm -hmm. there, was mm -hmm. the, there were capital ships on the China Station, yeah. there were capital ships in the Mediterranean. 
They could be backed up as required. Uh, if trouble arose with a particularly troublesome nation, which was usually Russia in the second half of the 20th century, then we formed a particular service squadron and the Russians were silly enough to have their capital on the coast. And so uh, we threatened to repeat what we'd done at Acre in 1840 against St. Petersburg, and it is we threatened at the end of the Russian war. Now, I w uh, eventually that country began an inexorable process of, well, I can't think of a better word, decline, although that can be overstated in lots of ways, but nonetheless, it happened. Um, round about 100 years ago, uh, the British Empire was beginning its pivot to Europe because of the rise of German naval power, a uh, major, major sort of reassessment of Britain's strategic priorities. Um, and of course, we are celebrating here uh, one result of that, which was the creation of the fleet units to try to look after what was in fact at that time a subsidiary theatre of the Pacific. But there was the plan, as we know, to create fleet units and uh, get uh, other Commonwealth countries like New Zealand, for example, to, uh, to, to subsidize a battle cruiser and build up a fleet uh, in Hong Kong. Um, the point I, I think I'm trying to make is that are we seeing, in the very longest of terms, we've seen the rise in India, the rise even more of China, are we beginning to see, and perhaps, you know, a relative decline in American power? which the Americans are going to have to cope with in the 21st century. The second half of the 20th century was no doubt America's century, beginning of the 21st. Now we seem to be moving into a situation where there are growing rivals, where those rivalries are going to have to be managed in various ways by direct relationships between the rivals and by realignments of states into various forms of alliances and entente. And in these circumstances, is the United States not going to have to, as we had to with our Commonwealth partners in the early 20th century, come into even greater relationships and greater dependencies uh, on allied countries, friendly countries, and build up a set of relationships. In a sense, oh, oh, echoing the last question, yeah. which is, you know, we are going to have to try to separate this general let's be nice to everybody into a more general kind of alignment mm -hmm. of which countries are on our side, potentially, in certain circumstances that might, we hope not, arise. So. Um, I, I deliberately didn't uh, talk about American decline in my paper because the, the trends that I outlined um, I think are, are underway regardless. Now, I don't want to sidetrack this into a whole discussion of, of decline, but I mean, in, in way, one way is look, the United, the United States has been in de uh, economic decline since 1945. Um, meaning that uh, at the end of World War II, most of the other major industrial uh, economies were in shambles and ours wasn't. Uh, and really as, you know, the, the success of post-war reconstruction and the success of the rising economies in Asia and elsewhere uh, means that uh, as a percentage of global output, the U.S. economy has declined. But if that's decline, I, I'm, I'm fine with it. Um, if, if you're talking about decline as pundits tend, tend to do, um, honestly, I, I think that those, those discussions tend to arise, and they, they arise periodically in, in American history, um, ba driven by sort of you know, uh, recent events, and at least, again, heretofore, the, the, I think the pundits have been wrong. I, you know, I remember the, the declinist debate in the 1980s. Uh, driven by Paul Kennedy and others, when you know the, the, the Japanese economy was going to was going to conquer all, and it didn't seem to work out that way. Um, now again, this time could be different, but actually, as I look out on trends, uh, whether they're in um, uh, fossil fuels, natural resources, when it's trends in manufacturing, including additive manufacturing, um, trends in IT. I'm actually quite bullish on the, on the United States and the U.S. economy. Um, so who knows? Um, but so, but my my view of of naval cooperation is not driven by need so much as it is the mutual benefit to the United States and to others. And I, I, I personally have three criteria for thinking about. Um, collaboration. Does it make sense for the United States? Does it make sense for our ally or our partner? And together, can we do things that disproportionately benefit uh, us by, by, by acting together? 
seems to me that if, if, you, if, if, if you can answer those three questions in the affirmative, then there's a case for cooperation. If you can't, it, it doesn't make sense. So, but the types, of, the types of things that I'm thinking about meet, you know, meet those criteria. Uh, so it's not driven by necessity, but I actually think by the promise of collaboration, or that's driven by the, the nature of uh, information technology, ISR, things like that, that, that really promise to give disproportionate gains to those who co collaborate and buy in. So. Thanks. Captain Manzi. Hello. <coughs> Captain Paul Manzi, Australia's Defence Attaché to Southern Europe. Um, my question is both to Admiral Haney and to Professor Minkin. Uh, do you see the development of area denial weapons and the potential weaponization of space diminishing the strategic significance of uh, naval power as we know it today? When you uh, look at anti-access kinds of capabilities, uh, and I go back in, in history and look at uh, in some cases, the number of ships sunk in World War II from a variety of different anti-access weapons. It's not some new theme, uh, quite frankly, that maritime capability has had to deal with. Uh, I think we learned uh, significantly during the attack on Pearl Harbor back on December 7th, 41. And uh, the business of uh, capability as it's developed, et cetera, Clearly, it's one that has to be appreciated as changes in anti-access capability, access denial capability improve, then similarly, uh, naval forces have to improve, but not just naval forces alone. Uh, the collective capability of our joint forces have to be able to uh, get at the problem. So I fundamentally feel there's clearly still a role in the maritime capability in, in this world we live in today and well into the future. I, I agree with the Admiral, and just to, to uh, maybe elaborate a little bit. Look, I think, I think the importance of, of sea power and the importance of navies is fundamentally driven by the, you know, the huge level of, of economic interaction uh, across, across the seas. Uh, and so, the, the real, you know, the real value of navies is, is driven by politics, it's driven by economics. The, the spread of precision strike capabilities, including the development of anti-access capabilities, is making that a more challenging environment uh, in which navies will operate, but it doesn't diminish the, the value of, of sea power and the value of navies. It just it just makes it a more challenging environment that, uh, that we have to deal with. And as Admiral Haney said, we, we've, we've dealt with challenging environments in the past. Um, in, you know, in retrospect, the past couple decades have been remarkably risk-free when it comes to the, the maritime domain, again, in, historical, in a historical perspective. We're just, we're just moving back to a, a, more, contested, a more contested commons. Okay, mid middle right and then the back. Yeah, thanks, gentlemen. This is uh, Lieutenant Colonel Nick Floyd from the Australian Defence College. Uh, my question is to both, uh, both the Admiral and to Tom. Uh, both of you gentlemen have provided uh, a lot of commentary about um, the global commons and where we're going with collective security uh, and indeed the confluence of sovereignty enforcement as well as law enforcement, of which are all very apposite and we, we've seen that those things are going to go forward. Can I draw both of you gentlemen on two particular uh, aspects of, of how that's going to be applied into the future? And that's both um, the, the appeal and the, access and the increasing accessibility of both the North Pole and the South Pole, particularly as, the, uh, as, uh, as Antarctica's uh, treaty is, is coming up for review in the near future. How would you see both the US treating those two issues and perhaps some, some insight into where you think uh, as a collective uh, global security uh, conglomerate, we should all be treating both those two issues. I think um, I think it's going to take some time for international shipping to uh, accommodate the availability of 
of, uh, of routes near the, near the North Pole. And, and one, just one point I would make is, quite apart from, from that development, you also have the widening of the, of the Panama Canal and you have the, um, the expansion of, of en route infrastructure along the major shipping routes, the major existing shipping routes. And so I think a lot, a lot is said about the benefits of, of travel uh, kind of along the, uh, along the North Pole. The, infra the en route infrastructure and the, and the port infrastructure on, on either way just doesn't ex currently exist, let alone the, the maritime safety infrastructure doesn't, doesn't fully exist to be able to exploit those routes. So I guess I'm, you know, I, I tend to see that as a future potential rather than a, a, a near-term issue. Um, Again, my you know uh, what I see on the international shipping uh, shipping market, it's it really is much more driven by um, expansion of the Panama Canal and and further exploitation of existing infrastructure rather than building the uh, the new infrastructure that would be required for some of these other routes. Yeah. A good question. I think uh, you know when you look uh, geographically, just the distances that being able to use like an Arctic route uh, becomes very appealing. Uh, and as uh, more potential exists, uh, that will, in my opinion, be utilized more. As maritime uh, force capability, the piece that uh, I'm concerned, are we looking hard at what capabilities will we need for that future? Because when we get the calls of needing help in search and rescue, uh, needing icebreakers, things of that nature, it will be a collective kind of response there as well uh, because it'll become more and more utilized. Uh, but as was mentioned here, uh, that time frame by which that accelerates uh, is a good question right now. But it is an area that bears uh, looking at now, it bears talking about in various diplomatic and what have you forms to make sure there is some understanding uh, of the nature of that environment and the rules of the road and international norms associated with it that, that are, in fact, very important. Uh, having had uh, various submarines that have transited through the Arctic uh, over time, uh, deep understanding of the harshness uh, and non-risk-free uh, of that environment, so it's not a trivial matter. Uh, whatsoever, uh, but it does bear some intellect, I think, today as we look at the, the future. Up back. Hi, I'm Aidan Morrison from um, Rubber Ducky Defence, a uh, small Australian defence tech company. Um, I had a question for Professor Hankin, um, but I'd like to invite a comment from Admiral Haney um, about force structure. Um, Professor Hankin, your third and fourth suggestion said we should have uh, forces which should be more survival uh, when they're deployed forward and also be able to strike from further away. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to me that would exacerbate the other trend that you identified, that uh, navies are becoming much more expensive, mm -hmm. um, which, uh, which is going to cause issues for presence and being able to have ships in different places at different times. Is that uh, divergent requirement, is there, is there any emergent solution to that? And if it is differentiated forces, could you flesh out a little further where we might differentiate our forces for um, peacetime presence um, in our current force structure, or what future force developments might be required to, um, to bridge that gap in requirement? Mm -hmm. um, so, let me, let me actually pose a couple of, um, uh, of alternatives that are kind of a, that bracket the, you know, the, end, uh, the ends of the spectrum, and, and I really think that the, the reality uh, lies in the middle, which is why I talked about differentiating forces. So, you know, one, one alternative in a, in a contested environment uh, is to you know is to is to pull back and and think about uh, operating from from a distance. Uh, what you're doing there is is reducing the risk to your to your forces. You're reducing your operational risk or your tactical risk to your forces. Um, but the you know but if you do too much of that, you're actually driving up strategic risk, which is you're you're driving up risk to your to your to your relationships, to your to your uh, uh, to your alliances, you risk becoming a, sort of a garrison a garrison force and undermining 
uh, presence undermining uh, international norms and so forth. The other, you know, the other, uh, the other ideal type is uh, staying forward deployed and, and accepting, uh, accepting greater, uh, greater risk to your forces, um, but that can, uh, you can lose credibility if you do that uh, too much as well. I mean, the U.S., the story of the, so the U.S. Asiatic uh, squadron kind of on the, on the eve of, of World War II, where you have forward deployed forces that really aren't survivable. Um, is, is problematic. So what I think is you need to, you need to do both. So you need to uh, harden and diversify forward, forward-based uh, forces. Uh, and then you also have to have the ability to, to reinforce them. Um, and so I think that means, um, to the extent possible, uh, building in redundancy, um, having probably more uh, but perhaps less capable forces uh, forward uh, initially, but then having kind of more, more capable uh, um, forces in kind of in, in backup. Um, so that's, I mean, it's, it's a way of coping with the operational environment, also coping with the, uh, um, some of the economic budgetary challenges and, and the, uh, the cost, cost drivers as well. Uh, good question. Uh, the, uh Overall approach, you know, when you look at force structure, has to be in balance with, uh, you know, ends, ways, and means. And uh, very important uh, as you look at the various, uh, not just strategies, but operational plans to deal with conflict. And uh, that in itself would probably be a two-week discussion, which I'll try to condense a little bit here. As you look at this, at least from the United States of America's approach, and as we look at providing uh, our uh, national security apparatus a range of military options, uh, we have evolved into a joint, joint construct. And uh, so it's integration of maritime capabilities along with other things. And then taking this balanced approach so that we can, in fact, uh, balance things holistically, looking at risk. So in my opinion, you've got to have an assortment of platforms to do different things. It can't just all be super high end. Those are applicable where required. But then at the other side of coin, you have to have uh, other platforms uh, that are able to be built in increased numbers and what have you. As I look at the future of maritime capability, in that same vein, as we look at going through, or in our case, a very rigorous requirements process before we can go buy something, it's how do we infuse as much uh, future payload capability that can be rolled in and rolled out for the, as the technology changes and allows us to have even different approaches in the maritime domain than perhaps we're accustomed to uh, and where we are today. I feel that's immensely important as we look at both the cost curve as well as the capability curve. And then, as I say, this business of fusing the maritime capability with other capabilities in order to win. Last question. Lieutenant Commander John Bird, Navy League of Australia. Just following on from the Twitter question, Professor Mencken, you made frequent references to service forces in your address. Would you care to comment on the, the role, the very special role of the submarine in deterrence, power projection, assurance, and so on? Thank you. I should actually ask Adam Haney as the submariner, but, uh, but I'll, I'll, take, I'll take the, uh, I'll, take the I'll, I'll take the first crack. Um, I think I think that you know the the role of of the submarine it actually um, helps illustrate some of the trends that I talked about. Um, if one you know if one thinks just about combat effectiveness, strike capability, um, undersea forces and submarines, U.S. U.S. submarines in particular, I think are are, are you know premier strike assets. They are some of, you know, they possess some of the greatest combat capability 
in, in, the, uh, in the U.S. Navy. And yet, and, and their, I'd say their value is only going to increase over time as the, as the maritime domain becomes increasingly contested. And yet, we haven't very consciously thought about using submarines as instruments of presence or reassurance. Certainly have thought about submarines as a deterrent. Um, so you have a you have a, a you know a, a, a naval combatant whose one of his most precious assets is its stealthiness, and how you think about that also as an instrument of presence. Again, we we tend to equate presence with visibility. Um, how to think about presence and reassurance from a from a stealthy platform? I think is a, a I think is a really interesting question. Um, and I put it that as a question, because I actually think that there probably are ways, very creative ways to, to think about these things. I just don't think people have, have devoted enough, enough attention to it. But here you have a, a platform with enormous combat capability. Um, how, to, how to think about it as part of the, the flexible application of, of naval power, I think, is, is really a, a, an interesting question. Thank you for a submarine question. Uh, that's good, too. Uh, you know, uh, in our country, submarines have been part of the deterrence equation uh, for a good portion of my career, particularly in the nuclear deterrence equation, having served on at least one of those platforms. When we look at deterrence, uh, that piece is always in the potential enemy's eyes of how they see uh, what we're doing or not. I sometimes feel the most deterrent cape piece of a submarine is not being seen when we show the glossy of the carrier strike group and, and everything else. I frequently get asked, well, where is the submarine? And I just say it's there. I mean, where is it there uh, is uh, very, you know, is a paradoxical piece that you want, uh, quite frankly, some ambiguity. And I was recently well, not recently, I guess now it was about seven years ago. I was traveling through Africa, stopped in South Africa, and uh, they had recently got a uh, 209 submarine uh, from Europe, and uh, they let us climb all through it and what have you. And I asked, I was interested in the more strategic question, uh, well, you know, this is a tremendous investment uh, in terms of industry, manpower training and what have you to have two, uh, how do you feel you're going to use it strategically and what have you? And they basically gave me a similar answer. It's once we submerge it, it's strategic. Uh, and consequently, though, it's how do you tie all that together so that it's uh, understood in your strategic approach to the business. I'm not, even though a submariner, I lead the Pacific Fleet and I'm proud of all the different capabilities uh, I have to bear, to bring to bear on a, on a problem. Uh, and, and to me, the submarine aspect is one of those areas that's uh, darn important and uh, we work hard to keep that capability in our Navy. Uh, what bothers me in terms of trends a bit is uh, sort of that picture I saw there is in, in South Africa since then is how many nations want more and more and more to have submarines and then for what purpose, just like we were talking about the Arctic, the undersea domain is a dangerous domain too. Uh, but I will say I'm very proud of how we have glued that together in submarine rescue and that there is an international uh, response effort uh, in, in that regard. But with regards to presence, you know, we pull them in port periodically so that they can be seen and what have you, but it will never give you that mis that that picture as if you went aboard Perth or you went aboard Darren, Darren or, or any of our combatants that are out here on the Australian waterfront. The submarine looks small and shanty on the waterfront. Real key is what capability it delivers and the understanding of that capability. So uh, it's integral, and it, to me, it is part of the deterrence equation. Uh, 
that's used and periodically allowing it to pull in port to be seen is, is very important. Thank you. Thank you, Admiral. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our session. May I make one administrative request that uh, if you're attending the next session, you be back in here at 10.55 for our 11 o'clock start. Uh, but before uh, we leave, may I ask you to join me in thanking our speakers, not only for their presentations, but for their willingness to be uh, grilled for what was well over an hour in what I think was a thought-provoking and extremely useful session. So if you could express your thanks to both of our speakers in the usual way. Thank you. Thank you.